The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, good Roman nails and dogwood crosses. A President George Custer commemorative paper band on an exploding Cuban cigar. And the latest entry in our complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's Hard Magic. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain editor Tony Daniel. This time we have an interview with Michael Z. Williamson on his time travel novel, A Long Time Until Now is a heck of a book, one of my favorite to have worked on in, in the past few years, actually. Mike has not only done his research, he has created a complex and interesting cast of characters and a great adventure story, as well as some cool military stuff. Uh, the book starts with an armed forces convoy in Afghanistan filled with a mixture of people from different service branches, but mainly the army, getting thrown back in time over 10,000 years. They go with two vehicles and wind up in the Paleolithic era in Afghanistan. There's a great Robinson Crusoe aspect to just figuring out how to survive at first, but then other groups begin to show up, some belligerent, including, as you'll see on the dust jacket covers, a Roman legion. It's good stuff, and we're going to talk all about it with Mike. And we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's Hard Magic. It's read by Bronson Pinchot. Now here's the news. The May hardcovers have poked their way up from the human race's collective unconscious and blossomed into great stories that'll set you to dancing around the maypole of reader happiness. We have a long time until now by Michael Z. Williamson. This is the most excellent time travel and military adventure novel we'll be talking about with Mike shortly. Also out in May is 1882 Custer in Chains. This is one of Robert Conroy's best alternate histories. What if Custer survived Little Bighorn and eventually became president, precipitating the Spanish-American War and making it infinitely more weird? The book has a great cast of characters, most of whom are trying to deal with the situation after an impetuous president escalates against the crumbling but still deadly imperial power. It's really good stuff. Bob Conroy died in December of last year, and this will be one of the last novels of his that we have in the pipeline. In September, we have the very cool novel about the rumored Alpine Redoubt for the Nazis, the one that would allow them to carry on World War II indefinitely. It was proved to be a, a rumor in real life, but Bob assumes that it wasn't a rumor in his alternate history. The book is called Germanica, and that'll be out in September. And in the fall, we have a straight-up techno-thriller adventure about a storm that hits the Midwest that is called Stormfront. That's also by Bob Conroy. But right now, at Booksellers, 1882, Custer in Chains, one of the most fun Conroys ever, and a long time until now by Michael Z. Williamson. So check them out. I want to welcome Michael Z. Williamson to the podcast. Hi, Mike. Michael Z. Williamson is the author of nine novels and a short story collection from Bain. Is that right, nine? That sounds about right. I, <laughs> I lost track at some point. We'll have to go check the notches uh, on your novel gun. Uh, Mike's first Bain novel was Freehold. His solo novels set in the universe of Freehold, either in that book's future or past, include Contact with Chaos, The Weapon, Rogue, Better to Beg Forgiveness, Do Unto Others, and When Diplomacy Fails. Wait a minute, is the weapon in that group? And the weapon. And the weapon's in there. Okay. Uh, Mike is also the author of the short story and nonfiction collection, Tour of Duty, and has collaborated with John Ringo on Pasolene War novel Hero. Um, Mike, a long time until now, is the first solo Bane novel you've done outside of the Freehold universe, I think. What prompted you to write outside of that uh, sandbox, as it were? I'm not entirely sure. I just had the uh, the idea came from somewhere. You know, the characters in the setting. 
I may have just been staring at maps for too long. I don't know. Has it been something that's that's been on your mind for years, or did it did it just come to you that like, I want to write this time travel novel? Um, I, it, I've enjoyed time travel stories in the past. Uh, I enjoy archaeology as a purely as a layman, just looking at some of the stuff and uh, paleoanthropology. Um, I was looking at maps of Afghanistan, saw some of these old. Um, settlements that date way, way back, and a lot of them actually haven't been explored, because uh, it's Afghanistan, it's the ass end of nowhere, um, there's a lot of money for it, and it's not, you know, the most glamorous of places to go do research. Mm. Cool. Um, I, there are so many aspects to the book, but one that stands out uh, most of all to me is the Swiss Family Robinson feel of the story. Not that it's it's a family, but they become a family. Um, can you set this up? What do our characters initially possess when they arrive in the Paleo? We should probably say some of the beginning of it, what happens to them, because it's it's on the book jacket, so I don't think it's a spoiler. Um, what, what, what do they arrive with? Um, well, they're on a, a convoy in Afghanistan, um, and they're slated to lead the convoy at various locations for various missions. You know, it's it's a mixed bag. They're not part of a specific mission. Um, so all of a sudden, two of the vehicles uh, wind up elsewhere. There's um, 10 troops and two MRAPs, and they've got the contents of their personal gear and the two vehicles. Uh, that's all they've got. So it's not much. They've got some MREs. They've got uh, some, some rifles, a couple of machine guns, uh, a couple of grenade launchers, uh, which are probably what well, they should have used against the woolly rhino, except that, uh, well, collateral damage. <laughs> um, they've got knives, some parachute cord, the, vic- the equipment aboard the vehicles, shovels and such, bats, a couple of coolers, and that's about it. And they have their personal electronic devices, which... Yes. I, you- I exaggerated slightly, because um, some convoys... Some missions don't allow people to take personal devices, but people try to anyway, and you know some do. But I, I gave them a little bit of an advantage there, where they have, you know, tools they can use. You know, the, one of the computers has a, a CAD program on it, and they can do spreadsheets and that. Yeah. One of the the cliches of time travel is that no elect- you know your electronics die and everything but you sort of turn that on its head and their electronics don't die they figure out ways to um, to make them useful which um really refreshing actually well I mean, solar chargers they, you know and there's also a trickle charger they can use for one of the vehicles so they can keep the uh, devices going and they say you know they've got autocad they can do spreadsheets um, they can do that uh, bane of military operations for the last couple of decades, PowerPoint. <laughs> uh, and these things turn out to be useful in, in, in survival mode, even. Um, they also have that... Uh, I looked this up after, because I didn't even know they existed, but um, they have a, a gyroscopic uh, razor blade for the guys that they pass around. I, I looked it up. I, don't, I still don't understand how it works. It's just like the toy gyroscopes. You yank the string and spin it up real fast, and it spins the blade. It's just an electric shaver. Wow. I saw you could get them on eBay. I guess nobody makes them anymore. But Likely not at this point. <laughs> anyway, very useful thing to have. And I guess it, and it certainly it, it's believable in the story because, you know, it's, it's uh, people that are camping out in many ways um, that, are, that are having to rough it. Um. So tell us about the people. This is not a tightly bound unit, but people who happen to be together on a convoy. Um, I know you've been deployed to uh, Iraq, Iraq, I believe. Um, tell us about how such a group might be assembled and the sort of people they'd be. Um, do you think this is a good representation of skills you might find on a, on a convoy, for instance? Overall, yes. I mean, I, you know, I exaggerated lightly. As I said in the uh, the article goes with this, you know, normal people don't adventure because normal people die. Um, so I, you know, I I gave them a couple of uh, advantages, but I mean, you will find people like that in the military. You find all kinds. Yeah, but, with uh, 
it's a blend of the services. You got some Air Force people, you got some Marines and some Army, right? No Marines. Yeah. There's one. There's one uh, Intel Specialist Board from the Navy. Um, there's a um, uh, woman from Air Force Security Forces who's a, who was ostensibly along for searching female detainees. Um, there's a reservist who's a Navy vet, and there's a woman from the Guard who's uh, an Air Force vet, and then the rest are all Army. Uh, I think most of the rest are active duty. But, you know, I mean, you find people... When I, uh, I actually, when I deployed with the Air Guard, I ran into someone from my previous Army Guard unit who was deployed with them just down the road. And then the... Uh, chaplain assistant we had had been deployed with the chaplain assistant from 76 brigade <clears throat> so you, you very quickly find out you, know, you you run into people that you knew or who know people you knew yeah <clears throat> the um the other thing that is that that really surprised me and that i didn't know is how very different the biology is from the present um the fact that we've been civilized has has really changed the world that we live in in a lot of ways. Tell us about the research. We should mention that there is a great article that you wrote about the creation of this book and the kind of research that you did that's at um, at Bain.com um, in the free nonfiction section. You can also get it at Bain eBooks in uh, free nonfiction of 2015. Um, the biology is different. There's not, uh, there's not crops, <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, um, there was uh, domestication before agriculture, when people realized that uh, you know certain plants thrived when they pulled the weeds away from them. It may have started as a form of worship, it may have just been a practical observation, but you know, they noticed that certain things that they enjoyed eating worked better when they were kept watered, kept uh, uh, distinct, and then eventually. Uh, Someone came up with the idea of saving the seeds. I've got I've got a hypothesis on that that it actually had to do with the uh, coming understanding of uh, reproduction. You know, seeds are tasty, but until you realize that seeds that fall on the ground start growing and are also how plants reproduce rather than just spontaneously from the ground. You know, a lot of things we take for granted. You know, uh, sanitation, even these days, even things like germ theory, were completely unknown <clears throat> for a long time. So this is, uh, there's probably some domestication elsewhere in the world from where they are, but there's no agriculture. And the things that are wild now um, have crossbred with things that, that humans have cultivated. So even the, the wild things don't taste the same. Right. Um, we get wild strawberries around here, and they, they taste like um, slightly sweet styrofoam. Um, there's very little to them. Uh, they'd work as a thickener for a stew, but they don't have a whole lot of flavor. Um, but, you know, some of the more um, vine-like berries, you know, the ones that we cultivate uh, cross-contaminates the, the wild ones. So, you know, really everything's been affected. And then, of course, we've done so much with agriculture, we've changed the entire landscape. And the, and the characters are, I mean, one of the, the themes of 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 the eating there's a there's a food theme that's running through this book that's kind of fun even though that it's not it's just um it, things are bland and they're just desperately trying to make the food not be bland um and the same all the time because they've come from a you know a, a advanced culture where you have variety yeah gotta find salt um it's, it's used for food it's used for industrial purposes it's a necessary nutrient um, you know, so that's one of the things they have to do. Uh, pepper doesn't exist in that part of the world, naturally. Uh, things like onions and garlic do. And then the entire family of uh, carrots, cumin, coriander are all related. You can take the tops of them and a little bit of variance and seasoning to them, but not much. Um, the domestic carrot's actually a very new thing. While the wild predecessor of it is very woody, very stocky, uh, after it's more than a few days old, it's not really edible. Uh, dandelions are edible, but yeah, and of course the animals are stringy and lean. They, they run around the plains escaping predators. Not uh, you know, They try and store some fat for the winter, but on the whole, the animals are not your, uh, 
your juicy tender steak. Yeah. When it seemed that they might have found a coffee analog, I I almost cheered. <laughs> they had they had seemed so desperate for it. Um, yeah, there's uh, there's Holly um, relatives that actually have caffeine in them. Well, a couple of your older characters are dependent on 21st century medicine. Um, there's a reason that people lived shorter lifespans in prehistory, right? How did uh, how did these guys try to cope with them? Um, with real problems, medical problems that they had because they didn't have their, their medicine. Different diet extends our lifespan, but it also brings a, a whole bunch of um, diseases with it that, you know, were less common. But, um, yeah, one's got thyroid issues. Uh, you can dry and eat animal thyroid and get some benefit from it. Uh, one of them's got uh, digestive problems. Uh, which I do, as I can wear that, um, you know, you, you can chew chalk or bone meal to get enough calcium to counteract the acid uh, if you can't get uh, some kind of acid reducer. But, you know, the changing diet also has some positive effects because a lot of these are aggravated by modern agricultural products. Our evolution to those is still ongoing. And the further you get from the genetics of the Middle East and Europe, the less adapted people are you know, particularly to things like wheat. Yeah, the let's talk about the characters for a moment. The leader of the group is uh, Sean, Lieutenant Sean Elliott. Um, I I like it that he's not inevitable when they they are thrown back in time. It's not inevitable that he will be in command, is it? Well, I mean, anyone in those circumstances is going to be highly stressed, and you know they all freak out. And, you know, he's hoping that whatever brought them there will take them back, but there's a limited amount of time you can sit and wait in the middle of nowhere for someone to come and get you before you have to move. And, you know, some of the other characters, whether it's whether there's a chance of return or not, they want to get as fast as possible where there's more resources, and he doesn't. So, yeah, there's some uh, there's a power play over that, respect issues. Well, um... Let's talk about Caswell for a moment, who I love to hate, by the way. <laughs> she's hot, she's intelligent, but she's also a strident feminist who thinks every man who glances at her is a potential rapist. Um, you really make her character fascinating and compelling, though. Um, it had to be a challenge to write her character. Well, for one, I'm not female, but um, I mean, not every male is a rapist, but there's always the risk of one. And, you know, I, I know a lot of women who've had creepy stalkers. Oh, yeah. Uh, either or relatives or, you know. And uh, that's one of those things that is a consideration. And from her point of view, well, she knows that she's, from a modern perspective, better looking than the, the uh, Paleolithic women. And, uh, you know, he's right there in the middle where she's potentially vulnerable. And I, um, a couple of years back, I actually made up a set of neck knives for an officer who was deployed. Um, they were uh, U.S. Army, but they were deployed with a lot of Eastern Europeans, and there had been several sexual assaults, and he had me make up a dozen neck knives to hand out to his female troops so they'd have something on hand, you know, even when you're theoretically in safe territory. So, you know, she's got legitimate concerns. Oh, absolutely. And the the circumstances, you know, she's every one of them is pretty much a minority of one in the middle of everything else. But it seems to me that she she can't she can she at first can't let herself have any fun or think of anything else because she's she's obsessed on this, um, and she slowly loosens up over the course of the novel. Yeah, and they all have particular things they focus on. Um, you know, the one NCO is, you know, he, he's afraid of something for taking them all back and him being left behind. And he's reluctant to go anywhere outside the group in case it happens while he's gone. And, uh, you know, you know, each one of them has their own thing they focus on, uh, because there's, there's just too much of a big picture to focus on everything. And they're trying to find a place for themselves in this group. Some of them are more readily able to do that than others, but they all have to find a meaning to what they're doing. Um, 
or else they'll just be scared, um, <laughs> terrified all the time in in this strange new place. There, the book is a is a ensemble piece about the characters as well. You go into each of their points of views, um, and I think that's a, a great part of it. There's fighting in the book as well as surviving. <laughs> There are the natives that they first, the real, the indigenous to that time period. Um, what is their life like before um, they meet our folks and sort of get a little transformed? Um, I, I picked a group that had a, actually for that time frame, a choice location because um, the, the area I picked should be slightly moister and uh, uh, more amenable than, than what we have now. And they're near a river, so they've got regular game, a reasonable amount. You know, they've got fish. They've got access to a certain amount of rice. So they've got a relatively peaceful lifestyle. There's not that many groups around the area. There's no reason for them to really do a lot of fighting. They, they go out and hunt. They grab some fish. And they store stuff for the winter. And then they huddle in the, the longhouse when it gets cold. You know, they're, they're, uh, they've got their... They're developing proto-religion. They've got an animism. And uh, they're aware of other groups, and there's enough... They're distinct, but there's enough similarity between groups that these people showing up out of nowhere, dressed in these strange clothes and not speaking anything, any common words, is a bit of a puzzlement to them. They're also kind of filthy. Um, <laughs> they're not, at first, very attractive to our to our group. Just as well, I mean, they do bathe. But I mean, when when you're taking animals apart for you know for hides and for meat, and then to use the guts for uh, rope or for making sausage, and you know the bones for uh, handicrafts. I mean, you're going to get filthy and disgusting in short order. You know, you can rinse off, but then you, you, you the next day is just like the same the same thing all over again. And of course, there's no deodorant. Um, there seems to be there's a, a whole lot of sites that have this whole noble savage presentation of people. But you, you ask anyone in the military who's done a stateside exercise in temperate weather, you know, mud, bugs, I mean, you, you're filthy in short order. It, it doesn't take more than, you know, minutes. Uh, even if you're bathing regularly, you're going to be filthy in between. Yeah, and if you live your whole life, that I, I like the the non romanticized version of the Paleolithic people, um, and they come across as real people as a result. Um, it, we other groups start dropping back through time. We get some slightly more advanced Neolithic sorts. Um, is there a reason for this? Uh, and they're more bellicose. Is there a reason that they're more bellicose? Do you have a? Do you think human progress inevitably produces strife, or is it? As we developed better technology for food, um, and they're, they're from, pro, from a proto-agricultural society, but they've got a certain amount of animal husbandry. But you, your people are better fed, you have more people, you also develop better techniques for storing food. And when you've got the ability to store food and move about, then it, you, you know, you, you've got more of an opportunity to interact with others. And of course, if there's any struggle over resources, then there's going to be fighting. Um, I mean, warfare would not really be possible without modern agriculture because you've got to feed the troops. In fact, it wasn't even really efficient until Napoleon had his people develop uh, well, bottling food in champagne bottles so they didn't have to scavenge across the landscape as they went. So the more advanced groups are have more of a background for a certain amount of uh, internecine conflict and uh, you know, are willing to do so for territorial uh, conditions. Well, also, um, do Romans show up? They're on the dust jacket. Um, we shouldn't spoil it, but tell us about how you you wrote your Romans, because um, I they it was a different sort of take on Rom Romans as well, and it felt very authentic. Well, they're they're a sizable uh, element, uh, and you know, of course they. The Romans were used to marching and then building a revetment for the evening and then marching and building something else. So they know they're in barbarian territory from their point of view, but it's not too much of a shock because that's what they did. So uh, they've got a fairly efficient camp set up in short order. They've got latrines. They've got baths. 
They've got um, ringed perimeters with sentries. Um, they impress some of the locals into being hunting parties. You know, they, uh, they, they do what the Romans did, which is to take charge of an area and make it part of Rome. Yeah, they they don't have any trouble with um with with taking over and right. and owning and the future people. Uh since this is science fiction, it may be possible to travel into the future. Uh and you know, a lot of science fiction have people from several years up in time with essentially just technological changes, but you really have thought through these these that sort of character, you seem to be saying there are going to be psychological and cultural disconnects. We might not even be able to really even grasp each other. Um, so how do you write such a character? How do you make them believable and, and compelling? Well, I, I figured out what technology they'd have, and then, you know, how is that going to affect their lifestyle? You know, I mean, when you can just request that your, your, your servant's uh, computer produce something you, without having to think about it, that that's what you do uh, when you're, you know, and, you know, look at families now compared to 100 years ago. Families are smaller. You don't have three generations, four generations in the same house, which used to be standard. So I, I speculated, um, you know, lower birth rate, uh, more dispersed, uh, more privacy, but at the same time as them having more privacy, they've got technology that makes privacy effectively impossible. So they've come up with a culture. Um, actually, the Japanese have something similar where you just don't pay attention to what isn't intended for you. And, you know, their technology helps with that. You know, they can put up uh, screens and, and such. But you know, if anybody really wants to find out about you, they're going to be able to. So that colors... Uh, their uh, their point of view. Well, let's drop back a moment. The Palisade Fort. Um, I just I felt there how hard it was for them to build that thing. Um, damned hard to build with no industrial age tools and limited manpower. Uh, why why would they go with the Palisade design? Well, first of all, I want to keep predators out. Um, there's a reasonable expectation that there might be some hostile groups around, and you want to keep them out. Um, you want to have a defined area that constitutes your space. <clears throat> you, know, you know, this is ours. This is the 21st century, regardless of what is outside there. <clears throat> and um, you need to keep the troops busy. I mean, if they, you know, bored troops play terrible jokes on each other, get depressed, get morose, get into fights. So keeping them busy is part of it. And, you know, once they're done, it's an accomplishment. They can look at it and go, we did this. This is ours. And it gives them a way to interact with the locals that, that right. is authentic. And, and Platoons of engineers done it in a week uh, or less. The problem is they've only got 10 bodies. Yeah. Well, all right, considering the whole picture you paint in a long time until now, um, getting thrown back into the past. It's it's obviously not a tourist picnic. Um, if you had a choice, would Mike Michael Z. Williamson go? Um, if I was guaranteed there was a way to come back, yes, I would. I would do that, and I might even try it with uh, limited resources. You know, just like going, uh, you know, hiking on the Appalachians or canoeing the Boundary Waters or things like that. But uh, yeah, I would uh, definitely want to know that it wasn't a one-way trip. Yeah. Have a little lifeline there. No, I was, uh, exactly. What are you working on at the moment? Uh, another uh, Rip Creek book, perhaps? Um, I've got ideas for one of those. I'm actually working on another uh, main universe freehold story during the war. And uh, different types of stress. I, I, you know, the, the characters in this one had very little fun. So I came up with characters who could have a lot more fun you know, when they're not in the middle of fighting. Um, a lot of space habitats, uh, a lot of hijacking of ships, um, you know, glorious mayhem that uh, my readers have come to like. <laughs> the, uh, I, we should mention briefly that, um, that you're nominated for a Hugo. It's not in fiction writing, uh, but it's, it has to do with the fact that um, 
Maybe not every. You have a droll kind of quality in your in your fiction and prose, but you um, you are a very funny nonfiction writer. We've collected some of this, by the way, in Tour of Duty. Yeah, some of it's in there. Um, this is uh, uh, one I got nominated for with wisdom from my internet, which is shorter, pithy comments that uh, you know come to me and I had posted and collected. I'm actually, I'm surprised it sold as well as it did. Uh, it's in and out of the top 10 in political humor on Amazon. It's hit number one in political humor. Um, I, I'd actually thought that for, because I really didn't pay much attention, um, that Soft Casualty, my short story, last year on Bain's site was, uh, you know, oh, a worthy story of uh, character. But um, it's also pretty. It's a pretty funny story, actually, in a in a very sick sort of way. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it can also work as horror. Yeah. A couple people asked if they promoted me. For I said, yeah, sure, go ahead. And the next thing I know, I get this email saying, uh, they said it was an email saying I'm a Hugo finalist. Well, um, soft casually. We chose, um, we chose, uh, Soft Casualty is in the year's best military science fiction and space opera anthology that Bain is putting out. Um, and people can vote, by the way, on the best story in that anthology. It'll be out in June. So, and I would, you know, I might pick Soft Casualty myself among them. I didn't edit this thing. Uh, David S. Sherrett is the editor whom many of you listeners will know is, is also helped with podcasts on occasion. I want to read the other stories in there. It looks like uh, there's some interesting stuff. Yeah, I think it's a fantastic collection, um, and we're really proud of it. Um, what's your takeaway from uh, from writing a long time until now? Um, do you? I I really found myself engaged in thinking about what it would be like to live in in such circumstances myself. I while I was editing it and and rereading your your uh, your work your revisions and such it stayed with me um and i think it's the kind of book that will stay with a reader um if they put themselves into it do you think we'll get a sequel um i've got ideas for at least one possibly two so you know i, I don't want to try and milk an idea till it's dead although you know how much money are we talking uh, <laughs> but uh yeah, I've definitely got some ideas for continuation in that universe. Cool. Well, the book is a long time until now. It's really good stuff, um, and it's now out at booksellers everywhere. Mike, thank you very much for being with us. Thanks. And now here is another entry in the complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's Hard Magic, as read by Bronson Pinchot. This portion of Hard Magic is provided by Audible.com. Get the complete audiobook at Audible.com now. If you're not a subscriber, you can get the entire audiobook free or choose from more than 100,000 other titles when you try Audible free for 30 days. Here's the setup for what's coming up. It's the 1930s in America, but it's an America that has been magically changed. In the 1860s, a handful of people from all walks of life were visited with special magical talents. In each generation, more are so affected. These people are called actives. Most actives use their powers for good, but some don't. Jake Sullivan is a private eye. He's also a former soldier, an ex-con, and an active heavy, the type of active that controls the force of gravity. Jake is good at it. Jake has been recruited by a mysterious secret organization of actives, the Grim Noir, who are dedicated to seeing humanity through a possible magic-based apocalypse. An apocalypse that seems to be accelerating toward a terrible finale. Here is Bronson Pinchot with this portion of the complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's Hard Magic. Chairman Okubo Tokugawa was sitting cross legged on a simple mat, watching the brothers curiously. Jane was standing a few feet away in a white kimono flanked between two robed iron guards. Sullivan? she asked in surprise. You okay, Jane? he asked. She nodded. She sure didn't look okay. Poor thing was scared to death. Don't worry. Dan's here. We'll get you home. The chairman spoke. Rise, first iron guard. 
Maddie jumped to his feet with superhuman speed. Sir, Grim Noir threatened the Geotel, Maddie said quickly, much more worried about that than the bullets lodged in his chest. The chairman nodded politely, as if to say, Tell me something I don't already know, stupid. I am aware. I have been watching. I dispatched shadow guards to retrieve it. They will travel back here shortly. Well, if it ain't Mr. Fancy Pants, Sullivan said. What are you doing down here, hiding? The chairman studied him carefully. He was wearing a simple, comfortable robe, and his feet were bare. As I said, I have been watching. This is a most interesting time for me, Mr. Sullivan. If I so desired, I could send my personal bodyguard up and your friends would be dead in seconds. Or perhaps I could just destroy you all myself. Then why don't you, big shot? Because I am bored, he answered truthfully. I have been alive for a very long time. I have lived for over a hundred years. I was born the youngest son of a minor samurai lord. My home was destroyed in a revolution, my family put to the sword, and I became Ronin. I had seen my share of conflict by the time the power came to me. Together we learned how magic could interact with mankind. Since that day, I have traveled the world. I have learned its secrets. I have seen the heights and depths of magic. I have been to every land, spoken every tongue, learned everything, fought every war, led men into battle, and killed legions with my own hands. I've lain with ten thousand women and sired a thousand sons. I sculpt nations as other men sculpt clay. I have traveled beyond our world and seen the others. I have spoken with the power face to face as we speak now. I have seen the terrible being the power fled from, and I have protected our world from it, in battle beyond your mortal comprehension. There is nothing truly new to me. Sullivan could sense he was telling the truth. If the chairman was anything, he was perfectly straightforward. So we were an interesting diversion? Yes. I could kill you all with a thought. The Geotel was never in danger. My plan will be fulfilled. As he said that, two black-clad ninjas traveled in, holding a strange device between them. It sparked and buzzed with energy, and Sullivan could feel the magic in the room distort toward it. It was only a matter of time. But you and your people interest me, Mr. Sullivan. Your strengths, your flaws, your hates, your desires, your loves and dreams. You are one of the most powerful natural actives ever born. Your young traveling friend is even stronger, though she does not realize it yet. We should stand as one, united for what is to come. Yet instead you will fight me to the end. Such purity of struggle is bitter yet beautiful in its way. I wrote a poem about it. Would you like to hear it? I'd rather slit my own wrists. Fair enough. The chairman turned back to Maddie. I am disappointed in you, First Iron Guard. Were it not for my preparation, the Geotel would have been lost to the Grim Noir, and not only that, but it would have been lost to the forces of a man that you had thought you'd killed. Maddie bowed deeply. Forgive me, Chairman, I can make it right. Sullivan was surprised just how much genuine devotion there was in his brother's words. At least he'd finally found something that he could truly love. Very well. How much longer until the firing? The Chairman asked absently. A man in a long black coat answered, Approximately ten minutes, sir. The chairman nodded. Very well, First Iron Guard Maddy. You may redeem yourself. Maddy bowed his head quickly, then moved to the side, shrugging out of his robe. All he was wearing now was a pair of very baggy black pants. 
Maddie's torso was covered in kanji scars. Nearly every inch of him had been burned, and every one of those made him more dangerous. He shouted something in Japanese, and a moment later another iron guard hurried forward with two swords, one made of wood, and one made of killing steel. Sullivan knew what was happening. He removed the tattered remains of his coat and canvas vest and tossed the rags on the floor. Matty smiled. Let's go then, little brother. He picked up the steel katana, swinging it back and forth so quickly that the air whistled. Then he tossed it gently through the air. Sullivan caught it by the hilt. Matty grinned as he took up the wooden sword, testing its balance. I'm literally thirteen times the man you are. Figure I'd keep it fair. The chairman nodded, appreciating this act of chivalry. Jane looked like she was about to puke. The geotel was steaming along behind five iron guards and two ninjas. The chairman saw where Sullivan's eyes had wandered, and he shook his head softly. I would not allow you to stop me, but I will not meddle in your family business. Carry on. Maddie was limbering up. His body was thick with muscle. Sullivan had seen him tear through hard men like they were nothing, and that was before he had been magically augmented and trained. Sullivan held up the unfamiliar sword. I don't exactly know how to use one of these things. You'll figure it out pretty quick, Matty said. You always was the smart one. Not always, he muttered. Sullivan was the youngest. Jimmy had been the smart one growing up until he'd been struck with a bad fever that had nearly killed him and had left his mind feeble. After their daddy had died, he'd stepped up trying to take care of his mother and his dim-wit brother while the oldest, Matthew, had done nothing but cause trouble. He'd been a bully, a thief, a jerk, and was only happy when everyone else had been scared of him. Sullivan watched the light reflect down the razor edge of the sword. Hell, we should have done this long time ago. That's the spirit, Matty said. Sullivan raised the sword. I'm going to cut you in half. Matty grinned savagely. Reckon you could try that and see how it works out for you. Begin, the chairman ordered. They met in the middle. The iron guards formed a circle around them. Sullivan swung as fast as he could, the blade driven by his vast strength. Maddie moved out of the way easily. He cracked Sullivan hard on the shoulder with the wooden sword. Try harder, he said. Go to hell, Sullivan snarled, hurling his power, trying to make Maddie fall toward him. Their magic clashed, neutralizing each other's forces. The swords met, and then they were face to ruined face, and Sullivan was staring into that dead white eye. Maddie grabbed him by the arm and used some movement to duck and hurl Sullivan over his hip. He hit the ground hard, but was already coming up when the wooden sword nailed him in the ribs. He gasped. They went back and forth. Every time he tried his power, Maddie came back with an equal amount. The iron guard was stronger, faster, and had more skill. The wooden sword swept in low and hit him in the leg, and even with his long, magically hardened bones, he felt the fracture. Distracted, he wasn't as fast, and Maddie's power dropped him backwards where he hit the floor and skidded away. On his knees, he swung the sword, but Maddie easily leapt over it and drove the wooden weapon through his shoulder. Sullivan screamed, and Maddie used one foot to shove him off the end of the wooden sword, Blood sprayed freely. He tried to rise, but Matty kicked him in the face. He rolled onto his back and drove the sword upward, feeling it pierce flesh. Matty paused. Looking at the sword driven into his ribs, he stepped back as it slid cleanly out. Nice shot, Jake. Then he shattered the wooden sword over Jake's skull. Sullivan was crawling away, blood pouring out of his shoulder and head. The scar on his chest was channeling healing magic, but not near fast enough to keep up with this. Matty tossed the broken hilt away and it clattered across the floor. You idiot, you fucking idiot. I told you, I told you I'm the strongest there is. I beat you with a bakken. You ain't done yet. Get up. Get 
up. He rose, shaking. Maddie punched him across the room. He collided with two iron guards, taking them all down in a heap. Maddie wasn't satisfied. He needed more. He looked to the chairman, who was sitting there showing no emotion. This ain't good enough. Maddie ran toward Jane, grabbed her by the hair, and pulled her across the room. She cried out in pain. Fix him. No, damn it, I ain't done yet. Sullivan crawled off the iron guards. Maddie shoved Jane down next to him. He could feel the warmth of her hands on his head, the hole in his shoulder closed. Somehow he knew that his skull was visible through the top of his head, but the skin pulled together and the blood quit flowing. He got back to his feet and picked up the sword. Jane scrambled away. Thanks, Sullivan said, tasting nothing but coppery blood. Maddie was pacing back and forth, unarmed but deadly anyway. He saw his brother standing. Again. They clashed. Sullivan fainted with the sword, and as Maddie moved away from it, his boot collided with the iron guard's knee. It was like kicking a railroad tie. Maddie punched him in the chest, breaking his sternum, then uppercut him so hard that he thought his face was going to come off. Sullivan landed on his back, but reversed gravity and dropped himself into the air. He lashed out with the sword and caught Maddie through the chest with the tip. Sullivan landed on his feet and pushed the blade in deeper. Maddie roared and grabbed onto the steel even as it sliced through his hands. They were face to face again with a foot of sword sticking out Maddie's back. You still don't get it. I'm the strongest there is. Sullivan's nose broke as Maddie's forehead slammed into it. Down was now up, and Sullivan fell ten feet into the air before the power tapered off. He used his magic to cushion his fall, but by the time he hit the floor on hands and knees, Maddie had already dragged the bloody sword from his torso. His brother raised it in both hands and bellowed, Strongest there is. The sword cleaved through Sullivan's back, through one lung, out his chest and dug deep into the floor. It was a brutal killing blow. Blood erupted like a geyser. Sullivan fell face down in a pool of his own blood. Failure. He could see the G-Hotel sparking, the chairman watching curiously. All he could hear was a buzzing noise. As his vision darkened, he saw Maddie's legs pass in those swishy samurai pants. And then he saw Jane being dragged across the floor by her hair again. Maddie was screaming something. And then he felt the burn as his wounds were stretched tight and flesh was welded together again. Please leave him alone, Jane was crying. You've won. Quit torturing him. Maddie shoved her out of the way and grabbed Sullivan by the throat. Last chance, Jake. Third strike and you're out. He shoved Sullivan back down and returned to the center of the room. Sullivan climbed to his feet. It felt like there was a ball of molten lava in his chest. He didn't bother to pick up the sword. Maddie was the strongest. But even the strongest can lose. He gathered all of the power he had left. No matter how tough you think you are, with all your Imperium ball shit and all your fake magic and all these punks looking up to you, you're still that same lowest dirt bully you've always been, and I'll never be scared of you. Matty watched him with his good eye. He was furious, the living half of his face red. Spittle flew from his lips as he screamed, Again! Sullivan threw every piece of magic he could. Gravity shifted ten times in as many seconds. Iron guards fell up, down, and across the room. The chairman, nonplussed, put out one hand to steady the geotel. Maddie threw up his hands, countering magic with magic, every kanji on his chest glowing bright, burning so hot to keep up that the wood around his feet blackened and smoked. Every loose item in the room fell to the ceiling. Windows shattered. The light bulbs all exploded and dropped sparks until the room was lit only by glowing kanji and the pale blue light of the geotel. And still... Maddie kept getting closer, teeth ground together behind his destroyed lips, tears of blood leaking from his ruined eye. 
Sullivan stood his ground, feeling the pressure as Maddie hammered him back. One of the bodyguards fell screaming out a broken window. Maddie finally reached him and backhanded him across the face. It was the blow of the mightiest iron guard, and it shattered Sullivan's teeth and wrenched his neck around. Sullivan landed on his back ten feet away. He started sliding away on his rear, crawling on his elbows, pushing himself back with his feet. Maddie walked forward, following him, ready to finish it once and for all. They continued for several feet, Sullivan grasping along, desperate while Maddie took his time strolling after him, savoring the moment. Finally, Sullivan stopped, raised his trembling hands, and looked up at the killer towering over him. Why the sad face? Maddie asked sarcastically. Not sad, he spat around his broken teeth. This is what I look like when I'm concentrating. He cut his power. Maddie's eye flicked up, realizing what was happening just as the katana dropped from where Sullivan had been holding it against the ceiling. The blade fell, the tanto tip piercing through Maddie's skull, through his brain, down his throat until it pierced his heart in two. Overloaded. The healing kanji exploded with the light of a bonfire. Sullivan surged off the floor and grasped the hilt protruding from the top of Maddie's head. He pulled his brother's face in close and whispered, You're right. You always were the strongest. Maddie's good eye was twitching madly in its socket, trying to focus. His hands came up, curled into useless, spasming claws. He was trying to say something, but the only thing coming from his mouth was foaming blood and a gacking noise. But I'm the smart one, remember? With a roar, Sullivan pulled the blade toward him. The razor steel cut through the rest of Maddie's skull, appearing right between his eyes, then through his nose and teeth. He wrenched the sword all the way out, opening him from top to belly button, and Maddie's organs spilled out in a gushing heap. Somehow, he was still standing. The front of his head split in two. One side was the face of a human, while the other was the shredded, white-eyed face of a monster. No amount of healing magic could fix that. Sullivan raised his hand, palm open, and activated his power. So long, Maddie. Gravity changed direction, and Maddie plunged across the room, through the window, and out into the night. That was another segment in our complete audiobook serialization of Hard Magic by Larry Correa, read by Bronson Pinchot. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com, thanks to Bain intern Christopher Ritchie, and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And a temporal anomaly sending a giant pit full of Roman legion spathas to his backyard so he can equip his own forces for the enforcement of anachronism and a hearty tankard of beer brewed from the 5,000-year-old recipe found in the Sumerian Hymn to Nikasi for Michael Z. Williamson, author of A Long Time Until Now. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy. And keep reaching for the stars. Bye.